in the previous Tory government. So the continued investment from this SNP government will help make that difference. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one, Keza Dugdale. I think I know the answer to this one, President Officer, but can I ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland and a trip to Manchester for the general election leaders' debate. Keza Dugdale. The First Minister has claimed that electing more SNP MPs will deliver full powers for Scotland. On Monday, her deputy said that there would need to be legislative process to go through to make this a reality. Within 100 days of taking office, a Labour government will bring forward a Home Rule Bill to put the Smith Agreement powers and more into law. Can the, can the First Minister confirm whether her MPs will table amendments to this bill to legislate for full fiscal autonomy within the UK? First Minister. Can I say, firstly, we will be happy to support any bill that transfers powers from Westminster to the Scottish Parliament. Secondly, yes, the SNP MPs will seek to strengthen any Labour bill or indeed any Tory bill to bring more powers to the Scottish Parliament. I guess the question for Kezia Dugdale is will Labour support the amendments of the SNP to strengthen this Parliament even further? Yes. It wasn't quite a straight answer to what was a very simple and straight question. Full fiscal autonomy is the SNP's central general election demand. And the First Minister said again earlier this week on the radio that that is what she wants. So I will give the First Minister another chance to be straight with the people of Scotland. She supports full fiscal autonomy within the UK. There will be a legislative mechanism by which this could be delivered. So will the SNP table amendments to the Home Rule Bill to deliver full fiscal autonomy for within the UK? First Minister. Well, first of all, let's see if Labour, if they are in government, bring forward this bill because Scotland's very used to Labour broken promises when it comes to delivering anything for Scotland. But secondly, the SNP stands for independence. I don't think that's any secret. And yes, we stand short of independence for maximum powers for this parliament. And that is what we will argue for. But let me also throw back a challenge to Kezia Dugdale. What else SNP MPs will be arguing for and voting for in the House of Commons is a real alternative to the £30 billion austerity cuts that Labour have signed up to. Will Labour MPs back that? And secondly, we'll be voting for an end to the proposal, the grotesque proposal to spend £100 billion renewing Trident on the Clyde. Will Labour back that? Because I know, so she can't bring herself to say the words full fiscal autonomy. It defies belief. It seems the SNP are developing a bad habit of concealing their plans for even more austerity on the people of Scotland. Order. Because we know that full fiscal autonomy would impose an extra £7.6 billion pounds worth of cuts in Scotland. That's billions of pounds of cuts to our schools, to our NHS and to our pensions. It's 130,000 jobs. In this chamber on the 19th of March, the First Minister said of George Osborne's budget, there is plenty that I would choose to reverse, starting with the austerity cuts that are going to be deeper than anything we have seen before. Can the First Minister tell us how much spending would increase in 2015-16 under the SNP's plans compared to the Tories? Yeah. First Minister. Well, you know, the only cuts on the horizon Order. for Scotland are the £30 billion cuts that the Tories have proposed and Labour have signed up to. Scotland's share of that £30 billion cut would be £2.4 billion. That's the reality. Now, in terms of what I propose, I've put forward an alternative to that. I've put forward a proposal for modest spending increases in the life of the next Parliament that would deliver additional spending of more than £140 billion over the life of the next Parliament. Uh, that is the alternative to the £30 billion pounds of cuts that Labour have signed up to over the next two years. So there is the choice people face 
It's a very, very clear choice. They can vote for Labour or the Tories or the Liberals and they're voting for more austerity cuts or they can vote SNP and they're voting for a clear alternative to austerity. Officer, we know from the SNP plans themselves that they don't plan to spend a single extra penny more than the Tories in 2015-16. Zero, nada, zilch, not a single penny. I can't work out what has forced such a radical change in the SNP's economic thinking. They tell us they are anti-austerity, but they don't plan to spend a single penny more than the Tories. They tell us they stand for public services, but they cut education spending, something the Tories didn't even do. And they say they are for full fiscal autonomy within the UK, but they can't tell us when. And the SNP won't come clean, because they know full fiscal autonomy within the UK would be a disaster. A disaster for our schools, our NHS, our young, our elderly, our working families, the unemployed, the sick and every single citizen in this country. Presiding officer, at the weekend, the First Minister talked a lot about guts and backbone. Where is the backbone to push for full fiscal autonomy within the UK she says she believes in? And why doesn't she have the guts? Why doesn't she have the guts to admit that the SNP's plans for full fiscal autonomy would be a disaster for Scotland's public services? First Minister. Let me just insert a few facts here. Firstly, we will spend... We will spend under our existing powers and resources an extra £600 million in the next financial year. I listened to Gordon Brown uh, on Monday and I have to say he took sleight of hand to a whole new level, even for Gordon Brown. He was promising to spend in the next financial year the revenue from tax increases proposed by Labour that won't actually take effect until the financial year after that. I mean, that is a nerve even for Gordon Brown. But what he didn't say, of course, is that the so-called extra spending Order. for Scotland will pale into total insignificance compared to the £30 billion cuts that Labour has signed up to. Because Labour can duck and they can dive, but the Scottish people have got Labour's measure. They know Labour is proposing further austerity and they know the only alternative to Tory Labour liberal austerity is the SNP. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no current plans. Thank Ruth you. Davidson. Presiding officer, this week more than 100 job creators signed a letter saying that the Conservative-led government has been good for business, good for jobs and good for Britain. That's companies that employ more than half a million people across the UK, including thousands right here in Scotland. So apart from Jim McCall, can the First Minister tell us what businesses have come out publicly for her alternative plan of full fiscal autonomy? Well, I think First we'll see, Minister. I think we'll see over the next few weeks what the people of Scotland, the ordinary voters, the length and breadth of this country, think about the record of the Tory government and what they think about whether another Tory government will be good for Scotland. There's a clear, clear position that people in Scotland have taken for my entire lifetime and that is one of rejection of the Tories because they know the Tories are disastrous for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Well that was pretty clear then none. No businesses have come out for full fiscal autonomy. You don't need a, a whole front page for that. There is a very simple bottom line and the bottom line is this that job creators are telling the world that conservative policies across Britain have shown that the UK is open for business. Okay. And those policies have delivered 174,000 extra jobs in Scotland, 57,000 fewer job seekers and created 38,000 more businesses here. At this election, Scotland faces a choice. Back to work with the Conservatives or back to economic chaos with Labour and this time with the Order. SNP holding them to ransom. Order. Let's hear Ms. Davidson. There is no wonder that job creators don't support their plans because it spells double trouble for our country. Because between them, the parties to the left of me are threatening more borrowing, 
no cap on benefits and tax rises across the board. When what we need right now is stability and security. So can I ask the First Minister? Order. Does the First Minister believe that any pact with this Labour Party could possibly deliver it? First, First Minister. Uh, Ruth Davidson talks about more borrowing. Uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, a member of her party, has missed his own financial targets in this Parliament to the tune of £150 billion. That's the reality of Tory stewardship of the economy. Now, I have to let Ruth Davidson into a wee secret, and I, I, I suspect it's going to come as a deep disappointment to her, but she's kind of wasting her time trying to convince me to vote Tory or that the Tories are good <laughs> for Scotland. It ain't going to work. So what I suggest to her is that she takes her message to the people of Scotland and see what they think. The polls are showing right now what they think. The SNP is leading those polls in Scotland for the general election, although I take nothing for granted. I take nothing for granted. But let me say this. If people in Scotland vote SNP, then they know that what they will get is a loud voice for Scotland in the House of Commons and what they will get Order. is progressive politics Order. better than Let's anything the, First that the, Tories, the Liberals or Labour have ever had to offer Scotland. Mark Macdonald. Uh, Th thank you, Presiding Officer. Today is World Autism Awareness Day. Can I uh, ask the First Minister if she agrees with the call that was made during yesterday's members' business debate to make Scotland an autism-friendly nation? And can I ask her if she will also take the opportunity to congratulate the hard-working staff of the Scottish Parliament who have become the first public building in Scotland to achieve the Autism Access Award? First Minister. Uh, certainly, Presiding Officer, on World Autism Awareness Day, I want to state that I share the aspiration of making Scotland an autism-friendly nation, and I give my commitment that the Scottish Government will continue to support the work of autism charities to increase awareness and understanding of autism across all sectors. Uh, the Government is committed to the delivery of the Scottish strategy for autism and is working with autism charities and statutory organisations to build awareness. I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate the Scottish Parliament in being the first building in Scotland to be awarded the National Autistic Society's Autism Access Award. All sectors of Scottish society should recognise and understand the needs of people with autism. And it is, I think, fitting that the Scottish Parliament should be the first to receive this award. I would now uh, take the opportunity to call upon all sectors of Scottish society to work uh, with us in making Scotland as a country an autism-friendly nation. Question three, Willow Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Last week I told the First Minister that people were waiting up to an hour to have their calls answered at the police control centre at Bilston Glen. Police Scotland dismissed my concerns, saying calls were answered within a minute. Well, that turns out to be true, because it's an automated machine. <laughs> a police call handler told me people can wait an age to speak to a human after they've pressed the right button. Sergeant Murray McKenzie told the police conference, supersized control rooms are a disaster. Calls are constantly lost. I told the First Minister about this last week. Since then, what has she done about it? First Minister. Uh, well, after FMQ's last week, I did, of course, uh, make inquiries, as I said to Willie Rennie, that I would do what I uh, have found out is that one caller was unfortunately left in the line for 58 minutes while making a 101 call. Uh, that was due to a technical fault which caused the call to repeatedly drop to the end of the queue. Uh, the issue has been resolved and the Chief Constable has personally apologised to the individual concerned in that case. Uh, 101 calls at Bilson Glen are being answered on average within a minute that is the case and what I can say as I said last week is that the Scottish Government will continue to work with Police Scotland and with police officers and with those answering calls to make sure that the service members of the public get is of a quality that they have a right to expect. Will there any? I, I do think she needs to look into the veracity of the explanation that she's been provided to say that there is a queue that only lasts a minute when it's an automated machine, I think is unacceptable. And I think she needs to ask more questions of the police. We have had, not just members of the public contacting me, but call handlers, and we heard what Sergeant McKenzie 
said this week at the police conference. I am increasingly concerned about the integrity and the practices of the leadership of Police Scotland. She heard them yesterday at the conference. She heard it loud and clear yesterday at the conference on stop and search, on guns, on the information commissioner, on targets. The leadership of Police Scotland seem incapable of being straight with their answers and now on control rooms. Her government has created this single centralised police force. What is the First Minister going to do to fix it? First Minister. Well, as I will always do, if concerns are raised at FMQs, uh, I will look into those concerns and I will give an undertaking to Willie Rennie that I will, as I did last week, look into the additional concerns he's raised uh, this week. Uh, I, like Willie Rennie and Ruth Davidson, uh, were at the Scottish Police Federation conference yesterday and we heard, uh, yes, concerns about a range of issues, but we also heard, and I think we should all reflect on this, about the good work in very difficult circumstances that our police officers do each and every single day. Take stop and search uh, as an example. And I think it is an example that illustrates the fact that when concerns are raised, those concerns are responded to uh, and actioned. Uh, so this week, uh, we've seen Police Scotland move to a presumption against non-statutory stop and search. We have seen Police Scotland remove the performance target around stop and search uh, that has been causing concern, and I welcome those actions. Uh, we've also heard Police Scotland undertake uh, to implement all of the recommendations of the report that Her Majesty's Inspector uh, published on Tuesday this week. Uh, we've also had the Justice Secretary set up an advisory group chaired by John Scott QC to look at the longer term uh, issues around stop and search and how we move forward on that issue on a basis as far as possible of consensus so that the public have confidence, Parliament has confidence, but police also have the flexibility to do their job in the way that we expect them to do it. So I would hope that Willie Rennie would take all of that as a sign that we do respond uh, to concerns that are raised and we do so in a very constructive way. Question four, Jamidi. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to protect babies from meningitis B. First Minister. Well, meningitis B can be devastating for children and for families. The Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation has recommended that babies from two months old should be vaccinated against the disease. Uh, I'm very pleased to confirm that Scotland will be one of the first countries in the world to offer a meningitis B vaccine as part of our routine childhood vaccination programme. Jimmy D. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Does she agree with the World Health Organisation that immunisation is a proven, safe and cost-effective tool for controlling and eliminating life-threatening infectious diseases, saving millions of lives every year? Given that meningitis B is life-threatening and is most common in babies and young children, does she agree that the rollout of the vaccine is a significant step in making meningitis B a disease of the past, along with polio and tetanus? And can she provide more detail on what specific age groups will be covered by this vaccination in order to save lives and tackle the effects of meningitis B. First Minister. Well, a total of three doses of the meningitis B vaccine will be given, and they'll be given at two, four and 12 months of age. All babies aged two months at the point of introduction will be eligible for the vaccine. And as advised by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, there will also be a one-off catch-up programme for babies aged three and four months of age when the programme begins. This programme does have the real potential to save lives, and I know everybody across the chamber will welcome it. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Another life-threatening disease is also meningitis W. Will the vaccine for that be offered in Scotland to teenagers? Well, we, uh, as uh, Elaine Smith will be aware, we follow uh, the advice of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation when it comes to vaccines that are offered in Scotland and uh, the decision around meningitis B uh, flows from the recommendation that GCVI has made. So we will continue across a whole range of uh, illnesses and diseases for which there are vaccinations to follow that expert advice and we will seek to apply that expert advice as quickly as possible. Question five, Malcolm Chisholm. To ask the First Minister what services will be supported by the recently announced £20 million to help tackle domestic abuse. First Minister. Well, the £20 million that I announced reflects my commitment to create a fairer and more equal Scotland. Subject to discussion with both justice agencies and victims organisations, the funds will be invested over the next three years in a range of measures to benefit victims, in particular victims of domestic abuse. It will help to speed up the court process, increase access to specialist advocacy support and legal services, and expand innovative initiatives 
initiatives such as the Caledonian system, which helps offenders to change their behaviour and reduce harm to victims. We will also look to improve education and understanding that violence and abuse are unacceptable in modern Scotland. Uh, the funding follows the launch last week of our consultation on measures to strengthen the criminal law against domestic abuse and sexual offences, including plans for a specific domestic abuse offence. I, I'm sure the First Minister supports the Edinburgh Domestic Abuse Court uh, service, which helps to ensure the safety of women uh, experiencing domestic abuse as well as their access uh, to justice. Uh, does she realise that this service, run by Edinburgh Women's Aid, is um, um, facing a shortfall of £147,000 from the 1st of June? So, will she use some of the uh, domestic abuse uh, money to help uh, to ensure this service does not shrink to a dangerous extent? First Minister. Uh, well, I am aware of the Edinburgh Domestic Abuse Court Service and I'm aware of the shortfall in funding that Malcolm Chisholm talks about. I spoke last week, uh, a week ago today, in fact, at the Scottish Women's Aid Conference and this issue was raised with me specifically. I undertook then uh, to look into this further. Uh, and such is the value I attach to the Edinburgh Domestic Abuse Court Service, which is delivering exactly the kind of services I am speaking about and want to see expanded. It's exactly for that reason that this morning I've written uh, to that service confirming that the government will meet the shortfall and allow that service to continue. Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, there were 60,000 incidents of domestic abuse recorded by the police in Scotland in 2012-13, an increase of less than 1% since 2011-12. Does the First Minister agree with those who think that that is likely to be an underestimate and that further work is required to First work Minister. to a extent? Um, yes, I do think uh, the figures that are published uh, and recorded will be an underestimate of the true picture. The Scottish Government recognises that the 60,000 incidents of domestic abuse recorded by the police in 2012-13 are not the whole picture. Uh, and even although the police record all incidents of domestic abuse, there will be victims uh, who don't come forward. Uh, we're aware of the complexity surrounding domestic abuse, and that is exactly why we have recently launched the consultation on reforming the criminal law to address domestic abuse and sexual offences. There are some instances of domestic abuse that we know don't easily fit within the current law, and that's why we're looking at whether to create a specific criminal offence of domestic abuse. Uh, I hope everybody uh, with an interest in this will uh, respond to that consultation so that we can go forward with action that makes the prosecution of this kind of offending behaviour more effective and that better reflects the true nature of domestic abuse as it is actually experienced by victims. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. While welcoming the additional funding, eh, can I remind the First Minister that the Joint Strategic Board tasked with the implementation of Equally Safe was supposed to provide an interim report by International Women's Day on 8th March this year. This has not happened. Can I ask the First Minister, when will the membership of the Board be published? When will it meet for the first time? And when can we expect an interim report? First Minister. Well, we're taking all of that work uh, forward as quickly as possible, but since Equally Safe was published on the 25th of June last year, positive progress has been made in a number of key areas, including uh, the commitments that were made in the programme for government and the consultation that I've already referred to. That progress includes uh, the Courts and Crown Office have put in place additional resources to speed up the processing of cases. Police Scotland is currently piloting a disclosure scheme for domestic abuse in two locations, Aberdeen and Ayrshire. Uh, we announced uh, that we will be investing additional funding uh, to tackle domestic abuse. Uh, these are some of the examples of the progress we've seen, but Rhoda Grant is right. We've got to make sure that this progress continues to move forward, and uh, I will ensure that the relevant minister keeps Parliament fully up to date with progress uh, of this work. Margaret Mitchell. Presiding officer, whilst this funding is welcome, will the First Minister confirm that the majority of um, sentences given to domestic abuse offenders are short term and therefore will not be affected by the proposed government le legislation to end automatic early release, which only applies to long term prisoners? First Minister. Well, Margaret Mitchell knows that uh, our proposals at this stage in automatic early release are to end automatic early release for long-term prisoners. 
uh, with the first government to take action uh, to reverse the policy that was first, of, of course, introduced by a Conservative government. We have had to invest in the prison estate in order to be able to do that, something that previous Conservative governments completely failed to do. And it remains our objective, as soon as we are able to, to end uh, the policy of automatic early release completely. So this government is making uh, progress on that, and I would hope that people across the chamber would welcome that. But I would say something uh, that I think is, is just as important. Sentencing around issues of violence against women and domestic abuse is very, very important. Uh, but we need to look at how we prevent abuse, how we support victims better, and how we change the behaviour of offenders. And that's why our strategy to tackle domestic abuse and the funding that I'm talking about is comprehensive in that respect. Uh, sentencing is important, but there's a whole range of other things that we've got to do much better as well. Christine Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the announcement of the funding and acknowledge that the majority of victims are women, but there are male victims of domestic abuse. And I would ask the First Minister to ensure they re receive support and that any proposed legislation reflects that this can happen to men as well as women. First Minister. Well, I think we have to recognise, and the Scottish Government certainly does recognise, that the majority, the overwhelming majority of victims of domestic abuse are women. Uh, however, that said, men can also be subjected to this intolerable behaviour, and we know that there can be difficulties in reporting where there are uh, male victims of domestic abuse. So I encourage all victims, regardless of their age or their gender, to come forward and report any incident of domestic abuse. The additional £20 million funding will, as I've already said, be invested in a range of measures, including widening access to specialist advocacy and support services for uh, victims. Uh, but I would say also already this government is the first in Scotland to have made provisions specifically for male victims of domestic abuse. So we funded the Men's Advice Line, which provides emotional support and advice for male victims. Uh, we have uh, funded Abuse Men in Scotland to help improve mainstream service responses to men who experience domestic abuse and the LGBTI Domestic Abuse Project to raise awareness of domestic abuse and gay relationships uh, is also supported by the government. So we'll continue to take uh, that comprehensive action, but we will also continue to recognise, unfortunately, the vast majority of victims of domestic abuse are women, and that's what we've got to tackle and tackle effectively if we are ever to have true gender equality in this country, which is something I and I know everybody wants to see. Question six, Mother Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government respects the right of broadcasters, such as the BBC, to be free from political interference. Yes. Can I thank the First Minister for her straight answer? I hope she would agree uh, with me that it is one of the hallmarks of a liberal democracy anywhere in the world that the media has absolute freedom from political interference. So when the uh, SNP backbencher Alex Salmon attacks the BBC for its coverage of the independence referendum and demands that it comes under the control, the political control of this parliament, is he speaking for her, her government, the SNP, or just for himself? First Minister. Everybody. Uh, well, I think everybody. Uh, supports absolutely, I know I do, the right of uh, the media to be completely free of political interference. But Order. I would suggest gently to Murdo Fraser that he might want to direct some of his own comments to members of his own party. For example, I agree, I agree with the former Director General of the BBC, Greg Dyke, when he said this, when it comes to deciding impartiality, we can't let politicians define impartiality. Uh, but these remarks, Order. these remarks were made in response to threats to the BBC licence fee by Tory party chairman Grant Shapps as a result of his alleged uh, bias of the, the BBC. And perhaps he would also want to reflect on the fact that last week the Conservative Party press office tweeted this, BBC showing clear editorial bias by saying there was no clear winner from last night's debate. So, with the greatest of respect to Murdo Fraser, I will continue to defend the right of all broadcasters and all media to be completely free of political interference, but I suggest he gets his own house in order. Stuart McMillan. 
Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, does the First Minister uh, think that the BBC will report the next time both she and myself visit Ferguson Shipyard in Port Glasgow uh, to see how Scotland's greatest job creator, Jim McCall, and the dedicated workforce are giving the yard a secure future? <laughs> That's way, way wide of the question, Neil Findlay. <laughs> uh, the media, including the BBC, will play a huge role in the uh, general election, but so will online media. Um, will the First Minister now show leadership and distance herself and her party from websites and blogs who revel in nasty, vindictive and gutter politics? <laughs> That's way wide of the question, First Minister. First Minister. I think, I think I might know about some of the websites and blogs he's talking about. They're nothing to do with this side of the chamber. Let me say quite clearly, as somebody who is an enthusiastic, sometimes too enthusiastic yeah. user of social media, I will always condemn anybody from any side of politics who indulges in abuse. I did that very openly in this chamber just a couple of weeks ago. Can I call on all parties to do likewise? It's not too long ago that a prominent Labour councillor in Aberdeen accused one of my colleagues disgracefully of using his child for political purposes. And the response of the Labour Party was his tweets were a matter for him. So if you want to ask me to lead by example. I'm happy to accept that challenge, but a bit like I said to Myrtle Fraser, I would call on Labour to get its own house in order as well. That ends First Minister's questions. We'll now move into members' business. Members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.